like he said, my name is Brennan Stonerock. I'm the regional perfusion manager uh, for Spectrum Medical here in the southeast. Um, I'm a perfusionist by trade to give you a little background. I also worked, um, I worked in Georgia. I did neonates, pediatrics, and adults. Did a lot of ECMO in South Carolina, which is where I live now. Worked with McKay prior to joining Spectrum a few months back. Um, and like I said, we're going to talk a little bit today about technology, uh, what we as a company are trying to do and how we're trying to help you and cardiac surgeons and CVORs with the care of their patients. So getting right into it, a lot of people don't know what Spectrum is. Some of you may have heard of our Viper system. It's been around for a while. We have a lot of non-invasive uh, physiologic and monitoring devices, saturation hemoglobins. Uh, we can give inline PO2s, PCO2s, things like that. But we're really trying to become more of a perfusion company, like I said, to aid you guys in the care and management of patients on bypass in the unit, um, as well as give your physicians and you analytic tools as well as administration to, to kind of aid in the care of your patients. So we have a heart-lung machine that's over here that just came out at the end of May. Um, it's sitting next door if anyone wants to see it. We also have, this is our heater cooler called Mr. Frosty. Um, that I'll get into a little bit later, but the short version is we're going to eliminate water in the cardiac OR. Uh, the bacterial issues and infections that we've had have been an issue, it, it, have been a problem, and it's very expensive uh, and obviously bad on outcomes, and we, we don't want anybody dying. We're going to talk a little bit today, like I said, about our quantum workstation, and this is our ventilation module. And as we roll through it, I hope to get, let you guys see what we're after as a, um, as a company. Um, and so through talking with clinicians, and like I said, being one myself, uh, we have a lot of perfusionists on staff at Spectrum, and we all talk about these things. Um, the issues are that, you know, we're not getting any younger. Uh, I think this was specialty care rate in this study, but half of the perfusionists in the country are over 50 years old. And there's not very many new grads entering these schools. Um, I cover MUSC, and I was talking with the director of their program. They're maxed out, and they still can't meet the demand for what, you know, the jobs, the openings that are around the country. Um, most of you probably recognize this. The cases you're doing aren't getting any easier. Uh, the the, the two-vessel cabbage doesn't exist anymore. They're getting stents. You're getting the train wrecks that come in with valve disease, combo procedures, roots, bentols, you name it. Um, and then they're staying in the ICU longer because they have all these comorbidities before they get to you in the first place. So diabetes, obesity, uh, renal, other renal issues, you name it. So long story short, it's not easy to do these cases and get them in the hospital, fix them, and get them out of the hospital quickly. Um, victims of your own success, we just, mortality is at an all-time low. I mean, I think we understand the fact that, or have improved the, the outcomes and how we deploy bypass a lot and have reduced the mortality rates to almost as low as they're going to get. Um, and so where we're going to really see benefit <clears throat> and from a financial standpoint in the hospitals uh, be more profitable is by getting them, like I said, out of the hospital sooner, reduce their complications while they're in the hospital, and reduce admission rates as well. And then value-based health care, just very quickly, the fee-for-service model, which is what we're under now, is probably going away. Uh, the idea is that hospitals will get X amount of dollars based on their patient demographic, their patient population, and the procedures that they do. And the better they perform those procedures, and again, get patients fixed and out of the hospital in a shorter period of time, the more profitable they're going to become as institutions. So, and so what we're trying to do with quantum or a spectrum medical as a whole is use technology to improve the safety, enhance your workflow, uh, and ultimately, what's the word I'm looking for? Enhance or, or, or repeat high quality care, right? We want Matt and this lady over here to pump the same exact case and give the same high quality care uh, to every single patient that rolls through the room. Be it a, an experienced perfusionist or a new grad, we want to be able to deploy this, um, like I said, high standard of care. And this isn't anything that you guys aren't already trying to do, okay? Who has a hospital protocol, policy, and procedure book? Everybody, right? Who has a checklist on their pump record? Okay, if anybody doesn't raise their hand, they're going to get in trouble, right? And so my point here is you're doing this. You're doing M&M. &M. You're, you're talking about difficult cases. You're trying to understand what, ha what happened in there if there was an event, right? Gary Grist, I'm sure you all are familiar with the failure mode effect analysis stuff. The reason for that is to understand what we did, okay? 
and then try to prevent it in the future as we take inputs and information in, we want to predict the problem before it becomes one. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm sure everybody wants to, again, be compliant to those protocols, but it's hard. You got a black book sitting beside you that's four inches thick. I didn't know what my protocol was for malignant hyperthermia, you know, every single case. It's not something that you think about. Everything that could go wrong, it's hard to put that in your brain. And so the question is, can we use real-time surveillance strategies, right, and workflow improvements um, or enhancements to, pr to provide improvements to you and ultimately the outcomes? And we think that administration has kind of already said yes. Uh, everybody's probably on some hospital EMR, electronic medical record, or electronic health record, be it Epic or Cerner or Meditech or Allscripts, whatever it may be. Um, they've decided that by inputting and getting this data into an electronic format, is going to ultimately be beneficial. Um, the challenge is going back and getting access to that data in a timely fashion or at all in order to analyze it and see how well we did. Okay? And so, same kind of idea with Spectrum's technology and quantum. We want to give you the tools to, to, to go back and develop best practice or evidence based protocols. You know, if you think about it, who, so who's on paper record? How often do you, does anybody not chart a 15 minute interval? Is it frequent less, more? So five minutes, 10 minutes? Okay, the idea though is that even with the evidence that we have today that it, if these white papers or these, the, the research papers that we have, they're based off of our pump record at 15, 10, or even five minute intervals. You can have brain death at three, four minutes if you don't have any blood flow or any oxygen delivered there. And so by inputting or, or, or uh, integrating all these third-party devices that you use, blood pressure, cerebral oximeters, things like that, in, in real time, we get it second by second, we can show what we're doing, okay, and how, what kind of effect ultimately that has on a, on a, uh, on a patient's outcome. I, like you guys, are, are never going to write down a blood pressure of 22 and a, and a blood flow of 2.1 just because it's 9.15 and it's time to chart a line right and the surgeon said turn the, turn the pump off so he can lift the heart and look at his distal anastomosis even if the pump is off for 15 seconds or 20 seconds or five seconds or a minute that's not representative of the entire window that we're writing down on our on our record but we don't know and we have not had any way to date to know what effect that decrease in blood flow and decrease in oxygen delivery had on a patient's outcome or a cumulative effect right Three times of a minute of pump off might not be a big deal, but if I got four minutes of pump off, that could increase my neurologic outcome or in increase my incidence of AKI. And we're never going to know that because it's not going to be on our pump record. So how do we know really how well we pumped a case? Same concept. We want to give you checklists based on the evidence that you've gathered second by second by second. Okay? We want to give you the ability to analyze your data that you've gathered. Okay? Ultimately, we'll talk a little bit more about complications, but case playback is what it says. We want to be able to give you the ability to run a case back from start to finish in real time, okay, and see exactly what happened, and then you can analyze well, when these certain variables go in, a, in this direction, let's figure out why they went that way, and hopefully we can predict them or prevent them, I mean, in the future. And then ultimately ensure compliance to make sure that every, pay, every clinician is delivering the same high-quality, repeatable care no matter if they're a new grad, a five years experience, or 15. <clears throat> and so what can we learn from the automotive industry, right? I bet we all have cars and we all drive them. And they have used technology, this is a very busy slide, but the gist of it is there's a lot more people than there were 80 years ago. We're driving a lot more miles. This is vehicle miles driven in the tens of billions. So this is three trillion, right? Three trillion miles we drive annually in 2015, and yet the deaths per billion miles are very low. Okay, I think we all would agree that cars are a lot safer now than they were 10 years ago, 50 years ago. Okay, Scott, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you probably rode around without a seatbelt in the back seat of a, a eight-ton truck, right? <laughs> What's a seatbelt? Um, and so, what has led to that? Well, every there's airbags everywhere side curtain, front, rear, you know, there's airbags all over the place. Um, heads up display, you don't have to look down even at a console which is right below you to see how fast you're going. 
you can look right down the road and, and not take your eyes off what's coming down the uh, coming at you or in your, your field of travel. There's lane departure systems that alert you when you start to drift out of the lines or even correct for you by steering you back into um, into the lane. And so again, the gist of it is there's a lot of infor a lot of information and variables out there on the road and technology has helped to reduce the deaths, reduce the accidents, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Same thing with airlines. Did anybody fly in here today or yesterday? I did too. There were two pilots on my airplane, and I bet 95% of the flight was by autopilot. And it's not to say we don't need pilots, okay, that we still need pilots, we still need perfusionists. We have to have somebody to input all these settings, um, but the airline industry developed multiple checklists, lots of redundancies to make sure that your travel is safe and that we don't crash. They even can, if you're about to hit a mountain, the plane can take over and increase your altitude and, and avoid that even if a pilot's trying to get them down a bad path, uh, which ultimately helps improve the outcomes and reduce risk. And that same model is what we're trying to achieve in cardiac surgery. And so if you think about what you look at as a clinician, right, there is a lot of information that you're having to, to, to bring into your brain from a device that's over here, right, the Philips monitor you get your blood pressure from. You've got a cerebral oximeter and anesthesia that 10 minutes after you go on bypass, you say, hey, can you turn that around so I can actually see it? Um, you might have some blood gas machines behind you. You got a pump, a level, line pressures, cardioplegia volumes, all kinds of stuff, right? So we got a lot of information that we're practicing every minute, every 15 seconds, you know, and then writing down every 5, 10, or 15 minutes, though. Um, and I always like to joke, does anybody remember what the first two at the, on this list were? So even 15 seconds ago, we just saw this, and we've already forgotten what it is. Now, that's a, I'm not trying to pick on you, but I think you get the gist of it. There's a lot of stuff we got to look at and process. We're hit with a lot of information that, one, we don't know if it's important, and two, we don't know if it's even accurate sometimes. And so we want to try to help you uh, to avoid some of these, these issues before they come. And so we do it with a quantum workstation <coughs> and diagnostics module. That's what's on the right we'll talk about a little bit later. But basically, this is what, what does it. It, it. I don't want to dumb it down, but it's a laptop, or not a laptop, but it's a touch screen, an iPad that lives on your heart-lung machine. It can work with our pump. It can work with a Soren pump or a Trumo pump or any pump. Um, it can live there. But what it's going to do is centralize all the information that you use to monitor a patient during support. So your blood pressure monitors, your blood gases, okay, your heart-lung machine data, uh, your cerebral oximeter, Okay, to give you one centralized spot to where your focus is so you don't have to scan the room multiple times and possibly miss something. <coughs> it's an app-based system, which I'm sure we all have smartphones. We're comfortable with this nowadays. But it just basically means that if we want to do get to our lab results, we hit a button. If we want to do our checklist, we hit a button. Okay? We, can, we live on your hospital network, which I'll talk about a little bit later what that looks like, um, but essentially we can automate a lot of what you're already charting, right? So today you got a patient that comes in, you get your paper record, you get some stickers, you put it down, you fill out, you look at the chart, you fill out the height, the weight, right? You calculate a BSA, you write down your cardiac indices, okay? You're doing the H&P, that kind of stuff. Um, we can automate that. So you come in, if you scan a patient's armband or the sticker, that you have from the chart, it'll automatically fill in patient demographics, height, weight, blood type, diagnosis, okay? Basically, any piece of information, any device that can output data, we can input it. And as long as there's information there, for example, in a flow sheet in Cerner or Epic from the pre-op admissions nurse, we can then go get it and populate your record for you. Um, we can also grab your equipment and disposables. And so if you use a Terumo pack, the FX15, and you put 1,200 of plasma light and 50 of bicarb and 10,000 of heparin, every time you use an adult pack, you hit a preset, and it fills that information in and now makes it part of the record. Okay, and we run calculations, post-dilutional crit, things like that. And then we can export charges. So instead of filling out a piece of paper and giving it to somebody and hopefully they enter that into the charge record or whatever your charge management system is, we can automate that for you and at the close of the record, send it off. <clears throat> like I mentioned, we have checklists, just like you do on your pump record. But instead of manually checking it, you check it with your finger, and then they become time-stamped. Okay, so we know when we did it, 
to drive compliance. If some event happened where he had to crash on bypass, well, we just can make a note that says I didn't get a complete my the entire checklist, but I did the emergency checklist, right? And again, you can. This is all customizable, however you would want to set it up. We'll talk <clears throat> later about event-driven checklists, which I think are really pretty neat, especially in the ECMO world. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, best practice alerts. Uh, something else that's interesting. You know, we have a blood pressure monitor, and we have a heart-lung machine, and we all know that if our line pressure gets too high, we want to be. We want to know about it. If our level's too low, if we get an air bubble. Um, and so we want to be alerted when things go awry. And with best practices, we can now set alerts on every parameter that we're integrating from all these different devices. Okay, not just the heart-lung machine. And not only do we have highs and lows, but we take it a couple steps further and we give you the ability to set sustained highs and lows or even rate of change. So you might not want your arterial line pressure to go above 300 or 250 or 400, whatever you pick. Okay, but you might want to know if it goes up by 50 millimeters of mercury in two seconds. Okay, or, or any value that you can think of. If you're on ECMO and you have a venous sat, you know, change, you might want to be notified about it. <coughs> and there's data that shows that this is important. Um, I think this is very interesting, and this is at NYP. I think it's, if not maybe behind the clinic, uh, the busiest heart center in the world, uh, certainly one of the busiest in the country. Um, and what's interesting about this is these people knew that they were being tested. There was a dude standing with a stopwatch right behind them, looking at them when things went out of whack, went out of their protocols. And they started the stopwatch, and when they addressed the situation, they stopped it, and then they mapped all these points. So even with some, even in the best of best, when we're on our toes, paying the most attention, we weren't very consistent. But with compliance alerts, we were. And this is one outlier that we always like to talk about. Um, this was us, okay? And it, it took them a minute to respond to it. And that one outlier changed the way we changed some of our software and changed the way that we reported that particular variable to the clinician to make that back down here on this line. And these weren't, you know, insignificant values. This was blood pressure, CVP, the heart's getting distended, pH, PO2, PCO2, right? So these are things that are very important. And again, all with statistical significance. <coughs> Complications is our app that um, ties multiple best practices together, right? So as an experienced perfusionist, you might walk into the unit and see a patient on VV ECMO and know that if the venous sat's going up and the arterial sat's going down, you've got recirculation. You need to reposition the cannula. Well, a nurse or an RT or an inexperienced perfusionist might take them five to 10 minutes to figure out that problem. And so by having what we call perfusion wisdom, and building logical algorithms into the system, we can notify you when there's a problem before it becomes one. Um, in this example, it's sepsis. And so the way this reads is if number three, best practice alert, which is temperature, and number one or two are out of whack, we want to have a notification. That notification can trigger a checklist, and it can tell us exactly what to do. So think of oxygenator failure, maybe, right, in the ECMO world. If your delta P is rising, your arterial sats are falling, your arterial PO2 goes down, we can send out a checklist that says, hey, make sure your gas line's connected. Uh, make sure that the FiO2 is at 100%. Make whatever, you know, we can't tell you what to put, but whatever you might think is the appropriate course of action, we can build that into the system and tell you exactly what to do it, trigger a checklist, you complete the checklist, and now from a legal standpoint, if that patient had a bad outcome and some attorney wants to come at you, you say, well, look, here's all these values that went in the wrong direction. What did you do about it? Well, I did my checklist, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and it was time stamped. We drew a gas off the oxygenator, and everything was fine. Okay? And so the, the, I'd say the, the benefit and the downfall to some extent of our system is the possibilities are endless. It's almost like where do we start developing these things? Um, but having all this information integrated into one spot can be very beneficial. <coughs> Excuse me. This is our diagnostics module. Again, all our technology is non-invasive, so it doesn't require a disposable that might be expensive that you have to buy every single case and put in line. All our sensors clip on the outside of the tubing um, and give you lots of, of data. And so the term goal-directed perfusion has been around for a while, um, but the, the, it, and again, it's not really caught on, I don't think, yet, but I think it's got some merit. 
you know, conventional terms where we look at venous sat and pH and lactate to determine metabolic activity and the adequacy of our oxygen delivery. Um, I always thought it was interesting, and I don't know if you guys experienced this, but every single time I'd go on bypass, we'd clamp, we'd give plegia, what happens to blood pressure? It goes down, we give some neo, blood pressure goes up, we were centrifugal pumps, so my flow would go down, but my sat would rise. And it's not because the, v the metabolic rate changed right away, it's because we're shunting and we're not getting oxygen where it needs to go. And so venous saturation in and of itself is good for maybe global ischemia or global oxygen uptake, but not necessarily regional, specifically in the kidneys and the brain. That's why we use cerebral oximeters to know that in that organ by itself, we are or are not delivering enough oxygen. <clears throat> and so this is a new term. Again, you can see what the, 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 um, the values are, but that's what our diagnostic module is gonna give you. It's gonna measure your inline arterial PO2 and PCO2. Um, it's gonna measure your sweep gas, measure your expired gas, so think of end tidal, right? Coming off the oxygen oxygenator outlet. <clears throat> and then we're gonna run a bunch of calculations to tell you how well you're doing. <clears throat> and again, there's data to support this. Um, this was Renucci's paper that looked at the oxygen delivery and the incidence in percent of AKI. And I mean, we, again, guys, we all know this. We know the more oxygen we deliver and the higher our blood flow, the lower the incidence of complications are. But a lot of times, you know, a surgeon's doing something and you might not have the volume in your reservoir to flow at a high rate and you ask him for chest volume. He says, I'm busy, get up, you know, I, I don't have time for that. And it's like, well, doc, if you don't suck out the volume and I have to drop crystal or get blood, that's gonna have an impact on this patient's outcome. And so if you could take 15 seconds to do this, our incidence of AKI and transfusion risks are all gonna change. And again, if we arm ourselves as clinicians with data to go to a surgeon to, you know, not force him, but to request that he change his practice a little bit, I think they're more likely to listen to us. <clears throat> and obviously it's expensive. Again, I think we know this, this is more an administrator point, but you know, essentially if a patient develops AKI, it's going to be thirty-five dollars to $40,000 more expensive to take care of them in the hospital system. Um, there was, I think this was Johns Hopkins, the Brigham, um, Harvard, and Boston, UVA. That's what it was, UVA. So they looked at a million patients over four years to get an idea of the cost of AKI. Now, we're not saying we're going to reduce your incidence of AKI, but if we have data that tells us, if, if you have data at your institution that tells you when you don't meet these certain goal-directed perfusion parameters or flow markers, that your incidence AKI is high, and when you do, it's low, that's gonna aid you in ultimately your hospital's financial state. And so summing this all up, you guys are doing best practices, right? You have protocols right now, but are we really monitoring those protocols and how compliant we are to them? And with technology and our software and our analytic tools, <coughs> excuse me, we can really get into uh, how well we're doing by gathering all this data in real time, giving it to you so you can change the way you practice perfusion to ultimately, hopefully, lead to a better outcome. Well, so how do we do it? I'm gonna breeze through this stuff because I'm running out of time, and this is the IT piece, which I think is very boring, but it is important. I will mention that if you guys are interested in this, it, IT is a big piece. We need your IT's help, um, but they're already doing a lot of this from an EMR standpoint anyway, so it's, it's not too, too tough. Um, but basically, we're HL7 compliant, which is the, the language, if you will, that information speaks or travels along your hospital's network. And so we can send data out and get data in. That's the bottom line. <coughs> we take a piece of your hospital server, install our vision software. It's going to interface with your existing network, Epic, Cerner, et cetera. We have a Viper workstation and devices run through it. Okay, we have live view, tablets, et cetera. Like I said, we're complementary to all, and, and we work with all major um, hospital information systems and, and EMRs. Um, the analytics piece, I think, is very important. Um, we can, like I said, get, because we have all this data now, it's very easiest for us to go back and query it, um, and, and then again, tell you how you did. And you can say, well, look, we tried to do this, we did it, and we got this outcome, right? If these outcomes aren't very good, let's try something different and then you can tweak your process as you, as you find out how your results are. <coughs> Live view, I'll show you some slides here in a second as well. 
is basically is where you can remotely monitor the activity of everybody on extracorporeal support, be it in the OR on bypass or in the unit on, on ECLS. Okay, as we click into a particular case, we can get more granular on the data, get waveforms, um, get clamp times, drug volumes, delta, you know, kind of pretty much whatever information we're integrating, we can see remotely. Um, and then on the analytics piece, we can tell you, well, look, this is how well you were uh, to your protocols. This is the percentage of time you were out of compliance or in compliance on different variables, such as mean arterial pressure, DO2, DO2 to VCO2 ratio, right? Again, whatever you might want to look at. And then we can tell you how well you did, maybe by user, maybe by case type, okay? Um, again, all to deliver, again, I keep saying it, but we want to deliver high quality, but repeatable care across the entire spectrum of, of patients. And then I mentioned case playback earlier, so. Um, like I said, this is our heart-lung machine. Um, it is very modular in design. It's very small. It's very lightweight. Um, it, it does a lot of the same things that, that existing technology does by way of level detection, bubble detection, pressure regulation, etc. cetera. Uh, but we take it a step further with the quantum workstation and, and try to give you more information to help in your care and support of patients uh, during support or during bypass or ECMO. Mr. Frosty, has anybody heard about this thing? So this is our heater cooler. It's not out yet. This is, the Heartland machine is out. Uh, we are doing cases in the States. We've done over a thousand cases, I think, in total overseas and here. Um, so lots of cases. But Mr. Frosty is our heater cooler. The cool thing about this is we're gonna eliminate water. Um, you know, the myocarchimera bacterium infection stuff is a problem, it's expensive and people die from it. And with this, we're gonna get rid of the water, get rid of the need for ice, get rid of a compressor that can blow, that the fan blows aerosolized bacteria all across the room and maybe blows into the chest. So that's pretty cool, we can talk about later. We don't know yet, but they, they tell us the end of the year, it's not gonna be the end of the year. Um, but sooner rather than later, and I will say, if I can, the FDA is really understanding that this is a problem and they're working with us to try to expedite it. The challenge is this is such, Can you, can you repeat the question so that well, the people if, on the webcast we, can hear? If we could, are there questions after or no? If, we could, if I could maybe talk about that after, I'd appreciate it. But um, uh, we're not sure when it's going to come out, but it is, like I said, going to eliminate the water piece. Um, the last thing I want to talk about real quick, if I could, um, has anybody heard of hypobaric oxygenation? Okay, so there's, it's a new technique, very similar to goal-directed perfusion, but I think it's important to talk about. Um, I will ask the audience, what's the worst thing we can do as perfusionists? Pump air, right? We know that there's air in our circuits. We accept it to some extent, okay? It's a risk of bypass, that's fine. I think we all uh, understand that. <coughs> what's unique is, again, we all know that somebody's gonna have some level of pump head after bypass. That's because there's air or ischemic areas in their brain and their cognition has changed, right? And we, you know, hopefully in time it'll resolve, and usually it does. It doesn't always, but sometimes, most of the time it does. And so we wanna talk to some extent about this um, and show you this is what a hollow fiber looks like. Um, I, I, I'm a believer in a lot of the existing technology. I think filters are good, integrated filters and reduction of prime volume is good. But this is what a hollow fiber looks like. Do you think an air bubble is really gonna pass through that? and go from the blood phase to the gas phase. And even if it does, it's gonna be hard for all of the air to be removed. And so hypobaric technique or oxygenation um, hopefully will resolve this. And so this is what we do today. This is what you do today. <coughs> you got venous blood coming into the oxygenator. It's low in O2, high in CO2, right? And then the rest is basically nitrogen. And so we pump in high oxygen uh, uh, gas in the gas phase that has no CO2 and we get diffusion, right? Diffusion gradients exist, O2 goes into the blood, CO2 comes out, and then leaving the oxygenator, we got oxygenated blood, a good arterial CO2, and then whatever's left in the gas phase is left in the gas phase. But look at nitrogen. Is this gonna diffuse? There's no gradient, right? So hypobaric essentially, and what are, bl most, blood, what are most air bubbles? They're nitrogen. And so hypobaric, the idea is we remove the nitrogen from the gas phase to allow the diffusion of nitrogen out of the blood phase. And what that means leaving the oxygenator 
is that any air bubbles that exist can naturally go back into solution, okay? And, it, and again, there's some data to support this, and I think this is extremely telling. Um, uh, this is Gibson. He did an in, viv in vitro as well as pigs in vivo. They put them on bypass. I think they ran them for four hours. Um, but they measured with the EDAX and Doppler bubbles throughout the entire circuit. Okay, so pre-oxygenator was pretty consistent. They're injecting air to get a, a constant. Post-oxygenator, they want to see what happened. Well, you, you know, you can see there's still some air. But what's unique is that even post-filter and then at the cannulation site, there was almost no air left in the system. And so the question was, where did it go? And the answer is it went back into solution. Because we've set up the blood or the volume, or the, the fluid side, I mean, right, and created this state, we've, we essentially have now um, a state that where any air bubbles that exist in our uh, circuit just naturally go back into solution. But it's not just in our circuit. Because we're pumping this fluid throughout the entire body, we basically make the body a de-airing chamber. Um, and so if you have an open procedure and you go to fill the heart, the idea is that any air bubbles that we're gonna get the gross air out with our vent, but any microscopic air hanging up in the cordae or in the papillary muscles is gonna eventually go back into solution and not make its way to the brain. Okay, and so after he did these pigs on bypass, he, he opened them up and looked at their brains and this is their white matter which deals with cognition and recognition and um, things like that. But there's a bunch of air there and there's very little air there. Okay, and again, I, not to be too direct, but which one would you rather be? If it's me or my family, I want to be the hypobaric group. Um, now, we're working at Spectrum on disposable products as well um, that I'm happy to talk about if anybody's got any questions. I think I'm running out of time. Um, but like I said, we're next door. We really, guys, I know I'm, I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid because I'm employed by the company, but I'm a perfusionist at heart, and I love what we're doing because I really think it's going to aid us and you in the care and management of your patients in the OR, out of the OR, um, you know, and, and ultimately, hopefully, improve outcomes. So, I'd, I'd be happy to answer that question if I got a couple minutes. What you were asking? Yeah, about the heater cooler. The mic. Can you go to the mic? <coughs> All these requests. <laughs> I was just asking if you were going to do the disposable handset so like every patient would have a fresh set of lines to the heater cooler onto the oxygenator. Not a fresh set of lines. What, and again, we're still in R&D. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to look. But that's but what I would suggest them to do, like if you could have disposable connections. What we're probably going to do, so it's a glycol-based system, which has been used in the food service industry for years and is compatible with humans. It's just a matter of getting that through the FDA. We're probably going to have an intermediary heat exchanger, okay? The glycol runs through that, and then you're, what we are envisioning, I think, is that we're going to run saline from this, that intermediary heat exchanger to your oxygenator, which actually solves two problems. One is waterborne infections, and two, which is very unlikely, but it still can happen, if you had a water-to-blood leak with today's technology and that water got into the bloodstream, that patient's probably going to die. And so now by circulating temperature controlled or regulated saline, if that oxygenator that you're currently using actually did rupture, the, the uh, heat exchanger did, it wouldn't be as catastrophic. Well, I don't think it, it would matter at all. You just, you'd have to do some hemoconcentration or give some Lasix. So right. huh. that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. Mike, thanks. With the exception of the uh, heat exchangers that are metal. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, we're working on a, a oxygenator ourselves that's compatible directly with the uh, glycol solution. Can't promote it on existing technology because we don't. It's never been tested, and so we're, for other manufacturers, we can't. We can't really t comment on their specs, but. With our own, it's going to work fine with no intermediary. It was, is, is what I think we're going to do. Not 100%, but still figuring out all the, all the kinks. Sir. So you, uh, you, you, sorry about that. <laughs> this mic's a little odd. So you've done these studies on pigs. <coughs> with we haven't done any studies, but yes, I understand. Yeah. Okay, so th they've been out on pigs. How soon before we actually see a product that can be used on humans? From us? From you, I, I or, say, or anyone, for that matter. I, I would say give us a couple, a couple. There you go, a year. Thank you. Yep. 
had a question from our webcast audience about, they want to know if, you, if your Mr. Freeze could be used on the cardioplegia circuit as well. Yes, so, so it is, yeah, so it's a dual, it's separately regulated and controlled um, to where you could run warm blood cardioplegia, cool your patient, or vice versa. How did you come up with Mr. Freeze? Mr. Frosty? Mr. Um, Frosty, yeah. You know, I don't really know. Our CEO came up with that, and he he says he's told me he wants to bring. Well, that everybody me? smiles when we hear Mr. Frosty, and and as cheesy as that might sound, that's what we want. I mean, this is a serious topic that patients have died. Um, it's rare, but it's a problem, and so we want to try to put some levity back into it and 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 make it people feel good about it. It is. Fun. I will also add. Just as a tidbit, we've got eight different pictures of Mr. Frosty. So instead of one, two, three, or four, you start to name these people. You got well, Al or P P Pinguiny, I don't know, whatever you want to call them, is is what you're using in the case. So, sir, that's a pretty interesting concept of hypobaric oxygenation. Um, in your slide, on the right, you're showing that post vacuum that the nitrogen was about minimal. Uh, one more. XX question mark, you can calculate that. You're still bringing that blood back up to 760 at sea level. 340 and 760, so you're looking at 420 still for your nitrogen. Your, PO2, or your partial pressure of nitrogen has got to round out that 300 plus the 40. It's got to have something. But we, but we don't know that these are accu accurate either. Again, this is, it's an estimate to show you the idea. Um, but we don't know how much nitrogen is actually going to come out because we can't really measure nitrogen in fluid, right? Okay, but those partial pressures have to add up to 760 unless you're releasing that blood in a, you know, hypobaric state to where it's going to absorb anything that it comes into as it reaches 760 because as soon as it gets out of that vacuum, it's going to go back into, uh, into some form, yeah. you know, pressurized state. Any other questions? Webcast good? They want to know what the um, what, what the protocol for the heater cooler is going to look like approximately. <laughs> cleaning? Cleaning? There isn't going to be a cleaning protocol. So no no more time draining water, wiping it down with cavi wipes, you don't have to do it because it's it's uh, um, the back, I mean, look, bacteria grows in everything. Let's, we'll just go ahead and say that. It's, it's everywhere, but the, what the glycol, the bacteria that grows in, grows in glycol is not pathogenic to humans. Um, and so, you know, in order to clean it, if you will, we recirculate it and dilute it out with more glycol. Um, when you say to clean, I mean like you just excrete the animal and then it's not <laughs> One day, maybe. Good? All right, thank you guys. Thank you, Brennan. Next, we have Al Stammers, Director of Clinical Quality and Outcomes and Research for Specialty Care, presenting Microaudio Protection, Cardiac Surgeries, Emperor's New Clothes. Thanks, Jackson. 